Kim by Roger Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Kim by Roger Kipling. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 15, Part 1. I'd not give room for an emperor. I'd hold my road for a king. To the triple crown I'd not bow down, but this is a different thing. I'll not fight with powers of air. Sentry, pass him through. Drawbridge let fall, he's the lord of all, the dreamer whose dream came true. THE SIEGE OF THE FAIRIES Two hundred miles north of Chini, on the blue shale of Ladakh, lies Yanklin Sahib, the merry-minded man, spy-glassing wrathfully across the ridges for some signs of his pet trafficker, a man from Ochung. But that renegade, with a new man-licker rifle and two hundred cartridges, is elsewhere, shooting musk-deer for the market, and Yanklin Sahib will learn next season how very ill he has been. Up the valleys of Bushar the far-beholding eagles of the Himalayas swerve at his new blue-and-white gourd umbrella. Hurries a Bengali, once fat and well-looking, now lean and weather-worn. He has received the thanks of two foreigners of distinction, piloted not unskilfully to Mashabra Tunnel, which leads to the great and gay capital of India. It was not his fault that, blanketed by wet mists, he conveyed them past the telegraph station and the European colony of Kotgar. It was not his fault, but that of the gods, of whom he discoursed so engagingly, that he led them into the borders of Nahan, where the Rajah of that state mistook them for deserting British soldiery. Hari Babu explained the greatness and glory, in their own country, of his companions, till the drowsy kinglet smiled. He explained it to every one who asked, many times, aloud, variously. He begged food, arranged accommodation, proved a skilful leech for an injury of the groin, such a blow as one might receive, rolling down a rock-covered hillside in the dark, and in all things indispensable. The reason of his friendliness did him credit. With millions of fellow serfs, he had learned to look upon Russia as the great deliverer from the north. He was a fearful man. He had been afraid that he could not save his illustrious employers from the anger of an excited peasantry. He would have just as lief hit a holy man as not. But he was deeply grateful and sincerely rejoiced that he had done his little possible toward bringing their venture to, barring the lost baggage, a successful issue. He had forgotten the blows, denied that blows had been dealt that unseemingly first night under the pines. He asked neither pension nor retaining fee, but if they deemed him worthy, would they write him a testimonial? It might be useful to him later, if others, their friends, came over the passes. He begged them to remember him in their future greatnesses, for he opined subtly that he, even he, Mahendro Laldut M. A. of Calcutta, had done the state some service. They gave him a certificate praising his courtesy, helpfulness, and unerring skill as a guide. He put it in his waist-belt and sobbed with emotion. They had endured so many dangers together. He led them at high noon along crowded Simla Mal to the Alliance Bank of Simla, where they wished to establish their identity. Thence he vanished like a dawn-cloud on Jacko. Behold him, too fine drawn to sweat, too pressed to vaunt the drugs in his little brass-bound box, ascending Shamless Slope, a just man made perfect. Watch him, all Babudom laid aside, smoking, at noon on a cot while a woman with turquoise-studded headgear points southeasterly across the bare grass. Litters, she said, do not travel as fast as single men, but his birds should now be in the plains. The holy man would not stay, 
though Lispeth pressed him. The Babu groans heavily, girds up his huge loins, and is off again. He does not care to travel after dusk, but his day's marches—there is none to enter them in a book—would astonish folk who mock at his race. Kindly villagers, remembering the Dhaka drug vendor of two months ago, give him shelter against evil spirits of the wood. He dreams of Bengali gods, university textbooks of education, and the Royal Society, London, England. Next dawn the bobbing blue and white umbrella goes forth. On the edge of Doon, Masuri well behind them, and the plains spread out in golden dust before, rests a worn litter, in which, all the hills know it, lies a sick lama who seeks a river for his healing. Villages have almost come to blows over the honour of bearing it, but not only had the lama given them blessings, but his disciple good money, full one-third Sahib's prices. Twelve miles a day has the duly travelled, as the greasy, rubbed pole-ends show, and by roads that few Sahibs use. Over the Nilang Pass, in storm, when the driven snow-dust filled every fold of the impassive lama's drapery, between the black horns of Rayang, where they heard the whistle of the wild goats through the clouds, pitching and strained on the shale below, hard held between shoulder and clenched jaw when they rounded the hideous curves of the cut road under Bagirati swinging and creaking to the steady jog-trot of the descent into the valley of the waters, pressed along the steamy levels of that locked valley, up, up, and out again, to meet the roaring gusts off Kedarnath, set down of middays in the dun gloom of kindly oak forests, passed from village to village in dawn chill, when even devotees may be forgiven for swearing at impatient holy men, or by torchlight, when the least fearful think of ghosts, the Dooley has reached her last stage. The little hill folk sweat in the modified heat of the lower Siwaliks, and gather round the priests for their blessing and their wage. Ye have acquired merit, says the Lama merit greater than your knowing, and ye will return to the hills," he sighs. "'Surely the high hills as soon as may be!' The bearer rubs his shoulder, drinks water, spits it out again, and readjusts his grass sandal. Kim, his face is drawn and tired, pays very small silver from his belt heaves out the food-bag, crams an oilskin packet—they are holy writings—into his bosom, and helps the lama to his feet. The peace has come again into the old man's eyes, and he does not look for the hills to fall down and crush him, as he did that terrible night when they were delayed by the flooded river. The men pick up the dooley, and swing out of sight between the scrub clumps. The lama raises a hand toward the rampart of the Himalayas. "'Not with you, O oh, blessed among all hills, fell the arrow of our Lord, and never shall I breathe your airs again.' "'But thou art ten times the stronger man in this good air,' says Kim, for to his wearied soul appeal the well-cropped kindly plains. Here or hereabouts fell the arrow, yes. We will go very softly, perhaps a course a day, for the search is sure, but the bag weighs heavy. Aye, our search is sure. I have come out of great temptation. It was never more than a couple of miles a day now, and Kim's shoulders bore all the weight of it the burden of an old man, the burden of the heavy food-bag with the locked books, the load of the writings on his heart, and the details of the daily routine. He begged in the dawn, set blankets for the lama's meditation, 
held the weary head on his lap through the noonday heats, fanning away the flies till his wrists ached, begged again in the evenings, and rubbed the lama's feet, who rewarded him with promise of freedom, to-day, to-morrow, or at furthest the next day. "'Never was such a chela. I doubt at times whether Ananda more faithfully nursed our Lord. And thou art a Sahib? When I was a man, a long time ago, I forgot that. Now I look upon thee often, and every time I remember that thou art a Sahib. It is strange. Thou hast said there is neither black nor white. Why plague me with this talk, holy one? Let me rub the other foot. It vexes me. I am not a Sahib. I am thy chela, and my head is heavy on my shoulders. Patience a little. We reach freedom together. Then thou and I upon the far bank of the river will look back upon our lives as in the hills we saw our day's marches laid out behind us. Perhaps I was once a Sahib. Was never a Sahib like thee, I swear it. I am certain the keeper of the images in the Wonder House was in past life a very wise abbot. But even his spectacles do not make my eyes see. There fall shadows when I would look steadily. No matter. We know the tricks of the poor stupid carcass. Shadow changing to another shadow. I am bound by the illusion of time and space. How far came we to-day in the flesh? Perhaps half a cos? Three-quarters of a mile, and it was a weary march. Half a cos! Ha! Ah, I went ten thousand thousand in the spirit. How we are all lapped and swathed and swaddled in these senseless things! He looked at his thin, blue-veined hand that found the beads so heavy. Chela, hast thou never a wish to leave me? Kim thought of the oilskin packet and the books in the food bag. If someone duly authorized would only take delivery of them, the great game might play itself for aught he then cared. He was tired and hot in his head, and a cough that came from the stomach worried him. No, he said almost sternly, I am not a dog or a snake to bite when I have learned to love. Thou art too tender towards me. Not that either. I have moved in one matter without consulting thee. I have sent a message to the Kulu woman, by that woman who gave us the goat's milk this morn, saying that thou wast a little feeble and wouldst need a litter. I beat myself in my mind that I did not do it when we entered the dune. We stay in this place till the litter returns. I am content. She is a woman with a heart of gold, as thou sayest, but a talker, something of a talker. She will not weary thee. I have looked to that also. Holy One, my heart is very heavy for my many carelessnesses towards thee. An hysterical catch rose in his throat. I have walked thee too far. I have not picked good food always for thee. I have not considered the heat. I have talked to people on the road, and left thee alone. I have, I have, hi, my, but I love thee, and it is all too late. I was a child. Oh, why was I not a man? Overborne by strain, fatigue, and the weight beyond his years, Kim broke down and sobbed at the lama's feet. What a to-do is here, said the old man gently. 
thou hast never stepped a hair's breadth from the way of obedience. Neglect me? Child, I have lived on thy strength, as an old tree lived on the lime of a new wall. Day by day, since Shamlech down, I have stolen strength from thee. Therefore, not through any sin of thine art thou weakened. It is the body, the silly, stupid body that speaks now, not the assured soul. Be comforted. Know at least the devils that thou fightest. They are earth-born children of illusion. We will go to the woman from Gulu. She shall acquire merit in housing us, and specially in tending me. Thou shalt run free till strength returns. I had forgotten the stupid body. If there be any blame, I bear it. But we are too close to the gates of deliverance to weigh blame. I could praise thee, but what need? In a little, in a very little, we shall sit beyond all needs. So he petted and comforted Kim with wise saws and grave texts on that little understood beast, our body, who, being but a delusion, insists on posing as the soul to the darkening of the way and the immense multiplication of unnecessary devils. Hi, my, let us talk of the woman from Kulu. Think you she will ask for another charm for her grandsons. When I was a young man, a very long time ago, I was plagued with these vapours and some others, and I went to an abbot, a very holy man, and a seeker of the truth, though then I knew it not. Sit up and listen, child of my soul, my tale was told. Said he to me, Jaila, know this, there are many lies in the world, and not a few liars, but there are no liars like our bodies, except it be the sensations of our bodies. Considering this, I was comforted, and of his great favour he suffered me to drink tea in his presence. Suffer me now to drink tea, for I am thirsty. With a laugh across his tears, Kim kissed the lama's feet and set about the tea-making. Thou leanst on me in the body, holy one, but I lean on thee for some other things. Dost know it? I have guessed, maybe, and the lama's eyes twinkled. We must change that. So when, with scufflings and scrapings and a hot air of importance, paddled up nothing less than the Saiba's pet palanquin, sent twenty miles with that same grizzled old Oria servant in charge, and when they reached the disorderly order of the long, white, rambling house behind Saranapur, the lama took his own measures. Said the Saiba cheerily from an upper window after compliments, "'What is the good of an old woman's advice to an old man? I told thee, I told thee, holy one, to keep an eye upon the chela. How didst thou do it? Never answer me. I know. He has been running among the women. Look at his eyes, hollow and sunk. And the betraying line from the nose down. He has been sifted out. Fie, fie, and a priest, too. Kim looked up, over-weary to smile, shaking his head in denial. Do not jest, said the lama. What time is done? That time is done. We are here upon great matters. A sickness of soul took me in the hills, and him a sickness of the body. 
since then i have lived upon his strength eating him children together young and old she sniffed but forbore to make any new jokes may this present hospitality restore thee hold a while and i will come to gossip of the high good hills at evening time her son-in-law was returned so she did not need to go on inspection round the farm she won to the meat of the matter explained low-voicedly by the lama the two old heads nodded wisely together kim had reeled to a room with a cot in it and was dozing soddenly the lama had forbidden him to set blankets or to get food i know i know who but i she cackled we who go down to the burning ghats clutch at the hands of those coming up from the river of life with full water jars yes brimming water jars i did the boy wrong he lent thee his strength it is true that the old eat the young daily stands now we must restore him thou hast many times acquired merit my merit what is it old bag of bones making curries for men who do not ask who cooked this now if it were stored up for my grandson he that had the belly pain to think the holy one remembers that i must tell his mother it is most singular honour he that had the belly pain straight away the holy one remembered she will be proud my jailer is to me as is a son to the unenlightened say grandson rather mothers have not the wisdom of our years if a child cries they say the heavens are falling now a grandmother is far enough separated from the pain of bearing and the pleasure of giving the breast to consider whether a cry is wickedness pure or the wind and since thou speakest once again of wind when last the holy one was here maybe i offended in pressing for charms sister said the lama using that form of address a buddhist monk may sometimes employ towards a nun if charms comfort thee they are better than ten thousand doctors i say if they comfort me i who was abbot of Sudsen, will make as many as thou mayst desire i have never seen thy face that even the monkeys who steal our loquats count for again he <laughs> he but as he who sleeps there said he nodded at the shut door of the guest chamber across the forecourt thou hast a heart of gold and he is in the spirit of my very grandson to me good i am the holy one's cow this was pure hinduism but the lama never heeded i am old i have borne sons in the body oh once i could please men now i can cure them he heard her armlets tinkle as though she bared arms for action i will take over the boy and dose him and stuff him and make him whole hi my we old people know something yet wherefore when kim aching in every bone opened his eyes and would go to the cook-house to get his master's food he found strong coercion about him and a veiled old figure at the door flanked by the grizzled man-servant who told him very precisely the things he was on no account to do thou must have thou shalt have nothing what a locked box in which to keep holy books oh that is another matter heavens forbid i should come between a priest and his prayers it shall be brought and thou shalt keep the key they pushed the coffer under his cot and kim shut away mahbub's pistol the oilskin packet of letters and the locked books and diaries with a groan of relief for some absurd idea their weight on his shoulders was nothing to their weight on his poor mind his neck ached under it of nights 
"'Thine is a sickness uncommon in youth these days, since young folk have given up tending to their betters. The remedy is sleep, and certain drugs,' said the Saiba. And he was glad to give himself up to the blankness that half menaced and half soothed him. She brewed drinks in some mysterious Asiatic equivalent to the still-room, drenches that smelt pestilently and tasted worse. She stood over Kim till they went down, and inquired exhaustively after they had come up. She laid a taboo upon the forecourt, and enforced it by means of an armed man. It was true he was seventy-odd, that his scabbarded sword ceased at the hilt, but he represented the authority of the Sahiba, and loaded wains, chattering servants, calves, dogs, hens, and the like, fetched a wide compass by those parts. Best of all, when the body was cleared, she cut out from the mass of poor relations that crowded the back of the buildings—household dogs, we name them—a cousin's widow skilled in what Europeans, who know nothing about it, call massage. And the two of them, laying him east and west, that the mysterious earth currents which thrill the clay of our bodies might help and not hinder, took him to pieces all one long afternoon bone by bone, muscle by muscle, ligament by ligament, and lastly nerve by nerve. Needed to irresponsible pulp, half hypnotized by the perpetual flick and readjustment of the uneasy chadurs that veiled their eyes, Kim slid ten thousand miles into slumber. Thirty-six hours of it. Sleep that soaked like rain after drought. End of chapter 15, part 1